This morning we're going to return to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we have uh, that passage we've been looking at uh, that talks about what it's like to be a transformed church family. And so I want to read the whole passage again. And uh, then we're going to be focusing on verse 15 today. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, and you can just follow along with this. I don't think we have it in the keynote, Robert. Sorry about that. Uh, This is one that you have to actually look it up in your Bible and follow along that way. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're focusing on verse 15 today. And verse 15 says this, See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another. No one repays another evil for evil. I think in my own life, and I think as I I walk with Christians uh, throughout, throughout my ministry, throughout my life, this is one of the very, very hardest teachings of the Bible. I think it's one of the hardest because it is absolutely counter to our nature. Our nature is one of self-preservation and one of watching out for ourselves. And this goes absolutely counter to it. It is a hard teaching. I want to share with you in regard to this three passages, three other passages that say the same thing. And we're going to begin with Jesus and his words this morning. So uh, in Jesus' own words, I want you to to follow along with me as we read out of Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 to 47. This will be up on the screen. You can follow along on the screen. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? I want to just look at a couple of things. We'll just look at these passages as a setup for what it might mean for us to actually not return evil for evil. In the beginning of this passage, if you go back to the beginning of it, it says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Listen to this next phrase. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. One of the, one of the definitions that Jesus had of being a son or a daughter of God the Father is that we live this loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us. Loving your enemies and praying for persecutors. Why? Because the sun rises and falls on everybody. In other words, God's grace, that is a general grace of God. How many of you know that if the sun would cease to exist, we are no more? And, and the sun is that, is that life-giving reality that, that gives energy to the, the reality of our natural self. And the sun is given to everyone. And God is saying, every person you meet, every person you disagree with, every person who mistreats you, every person who persecutes you is a person of value to God enough that he gives them the same level of grace that he's given to you. And so, in Jesus' family, life is very different, not like, as Jesus says, the Gentiles, which in that context, Jesus would have been talking to the Jews who understood that God was was their God and the Gentiles was everybody who was not a part of God's family. So, in our case, it would be anybody outside of the church. So, even those, there are people outside of the church who love people who love them, wouldn't you agree? And Jesus says, that's not what I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to love people 
who mistreat you or persecute you, and so forth. So in Romans chapter 12, Paul, we'll look at what Paul says about the same uh, issue. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is mine, or if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, that doesn't sound really good, burning coals on his head. Uh, and so that's a whole, that, that's a good thing. Just trust me, and we're not going to go into the heaping burning coals on your enemy's head. I mean, it kind of sounds like, ooh. Uh, so, but here's the thing that Paul says, never, everybody say never. Never evil for evil. Another translation, that word evil, it's in our passage today as well. That word evil can all, many times is just uh, just translated bad, never bad for bad. So if we, if we overemphasize evil, we might go too far and be like, well, you know, nobody's really being evil to me. It's really just kind of unkind. That's what we're talking about. So never repay evil for evil, bad for bad. Instead, bless and feed and love. And there's a comfort in this, I guess, uh, that God takes vengeance on and repays Whatever God deci- decides needs to be repaid. And how many of you know that if God decides that my enemy needs to be repaid, it's going to be better than anything I could have come up with? So, love your enemies. Again, I would say this is hard, hard, hard teaching. It is counter to natural thinking. Peter talks about this also in Scripture. And so, Peter, in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 to 18, this is a long passage. I want to just read the whole thing. To sum up, All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. I think just right here is a powerful principle that we need to understand. So in in Jesus' words, he said, if if you don't repay... If you love your enemies, it shows that you are sons of God. It, it, so that you will be sons of God. That's one of the parts of becoming a child of God. In Peter's words, he says that if you will live this way, you will get a blessing. And it kind of infers that if you don't live this way, the blessing either doesn't come or it's less. So you want more blessing in your life? You become a person who loves those who insult you or are, are evil against you. The source of living this way in these verses that we've just read is to be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. I want to just highlight humble in spirit for a moment this morning. Humble in spirit means that we are, and as we talked about this quite a bit recently, we are able to step back and look at ourselves with, with a fair self-assessment. How am I viewing other people? How do I view? And this is, you know, Norm was talking about the cowboy music um, and just just being in the person. It would have been possible, and maybe this was a temptation of Norm's, it would have been possible for him to feel, uh, what, uh, better than somebody who listens to cowboy music? Somebody say amen. I mean, it would have been possible. I'm not saying he did. I'm just saying it would have been possible for him if he wasn't self-aware, if he wasn't stopping and thinking about it. See, you see, what was happening with Norm yesterday is he wasn't just going with what he was feeling. He was thinking about, why am I feeling this way? That is not haughty in spirit, but being willing to say, maybe it's not you, maybe it's me. Maybe this, this thing I'm feeling isn't you, maybe it's me. Maybe I am haughty in spirit, and I need to be humble and self-aware. In our book, um, Emotionally Healthy uh, Relationships, we did an exercise a few weeks ago, and we're, we're supposed to be continuing to do this exercise. It's called Explore the Iceberg. And I think this is one thing that helps us get come down from our haughty spirit because it puts us in touch with what we're feeling. So four questions, four questions that that we ought to ask ourselves on a regular basis. Number one, what am I angry about? 
Uh, <laughs> if you're honest and humble and, and willing in your spirit, you should find some things that you're angry about. Whether you have been feeling it or knowing it or not, if you sit with the Holy Spirit and you say, Lord, what am I angry about? You will, as you grow in this, as you're humble in spirit, you will begin to be able to say, I'm angry about these things. You might be angry about what something Donald Trump is doing. You might be angry about something your boss did. You might be angry about something I said or didn't do. You might be, but, but there is, there's a real, you might be angry at your spouse. You might, but you, you're be, humble in spirit is willing to, willing to begin looking at that. Because frankly, I don't like to look at my anger because it makes me not look very nice. So number two, what are you sad about? Again, I believe that if you'll be honest and let the Holy Spirit speak to you, all of us at some level are carrying a sadness. I'm sad about uh, a loss. You know, I'm sad about, uh, 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 um, uh, I mean, all kinds of things. Two things that are happening here. One, we're beginning to get in touch with our emotions. We're taking time to pay attention to our emotions. Peter Scazzaro says, or I don't know, he says, uh, Ignatius, I think, said this. Ignatius, one of the fathers of the faith many, 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 many years ago, said that our feelings help us understand what God is speaking to us. So that if we will, if we'll pay attention to our feelings, we begin to say, no, no. So the, the question is, what am I sad about? Then we begin to go to the next level. Why does that make me sad? Many times it's very, because, you know, I lost something. Because why does that make me angry? Typically, when it makes me angry, many, many times it's because of my own sin in my own life. But sometimes it's because it's absolutely an unrighteous thing and we're supposed to be angry at it. Okay, number three, what are you anxious about? What are you anxious about? What are you, what are you, you're concerned about your money, your future, your family, your health, your job, uh, like that's my list. Anybody else? That's my list. Your money, your future, your family, your health, your job. That's, that's the list. And, you know, I don't have to. It's the answers are right here in the book. Or you might have other things that you're anxious about. What are you glad about? Maybe you have a relationship that you're glad about. The purpose of this iceberg uh, Explore exploration is to become somebody who is not uh, proud of ourselves, but is able to say, you know, I have anxieties, I have anger, I have sadness in my life, and we're able to begin to face that. I believe that is what helps us to be humble in spirit. Amen? Amen. So, going on in Peter's words here, the next slide. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. In the family of Jesus, in the new family of Jesus, all of us who are saved became a part of a new family. And how, how many of you understand Jesus' family doesn't do things the way your family did things? <laughs> or even Jesus' family doesn't do things the way your current family does things. We're all becoming aware of the way Jesus' family works. And one of the things that Jesus' family does not do is evil. The word, again, I'm, I'm going to use that word, that's the word that is bad, Another word, another translation of it is worthless. In the Jesus family, we don't do worthless things. We do things that matter. In another passage, doesn't the Bible tell us that we're supposed to, everything we say is supposed to build up. Everything we say is supposed to be lovely. We're supposed to think about what is lovely and true and just and right. That's what is the fact of the Jesus family. Jesus family does good, speaks good, seeks peace. And we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to do good and seek peace in just a moment. Going on in 1 Peter chapter 3. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. More keys. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. We are a self changed by Jesus, and we can never do this in our own strength, our pride. Our, we say, you know, I'm going to just begin to live this way. It always comes from Jesus. That's why we celebrate the body of Christ, because it's only in Jesus we can ever become Jesus' family livers. 
That didn't come out right. <laughs> Y'all got what I meant, though. Going on in First Peter. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right that, rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit." It's better to suffer for doing right than for doing what is wrong. Um, Jesus' family, again, always does good, and our ways show Jesus' family. So let's summarize those, those three passages before we move on. So in Matthew chapter 5, we see love your enemies. In Romans chapter 12, we are called to never pay back evil for evil. Never. Somebody say never. Never. First Peter 3, verses 8 to 18, we are not returning evil for evil. It's very clear, isn't it, that Scripture has a very clear uh, word to us. As followers of Jesus, you just don't do repaying evil for evil. Never. Never. So, First Thessalonians 5, 15, our verse for today. See that no one repays another with evil for evil. Repays another. What does it look like to repay another? Well, I want to just, again, give a little context to this. And uh, the other night in our Emotionally Healthy Relationships, we read a devotional. And in the devotional, uh, one of the things that, that we read is that the fact is enemies or people who are doing evil against us. And when you think of enemies... Uh, it's again, if we overemphasize evil and enemies, we think our enemies are, you know, overseas or our enemies are, are, you know, bad people who hate us here. But actually, the other reality is your enemy can somebody who just gets under your skin. Yeah, anybody have an enemy like that? I'm three of us, the rest of you. Hallelujah. You, you got somebody that just gets under your skin. This is one of your enemies. And one of the things that, that the, the book was telling us that um, this person is literally somebody who helps you to see the things that God wants to work out of your life and called them your saint maker. So you consider that Pam's getting it. She's, she's tracking right here. Yeah. The person who gets under your skin the most is your saint maker. How do you like that? And so if they become your saint maker, I have a question for you today. See to it that no one repays a saint maker with evil for evil. How, what are the ways that we tend to repay our saint makers? What are the ways you might, uh, what's that? Sarcasm, Sarcasm. passive aggression. Ignoring what? Talk bad, about Talk bad about them. You guys are good at this. You must have had some, you know, some experience with this, or or you, you know, or your enemies treat. Or this is your enemies you're talking about, right? So I, I made this is the list I made. It's all, pretty much the same. Number one, we when we we repay our saint makers by giving them the cold shoulder. We're just gonna ignore them when they're in the room. We're just gonna walk away from them. Years ago, I had a saint in the in the church. An older, mature, and I, I put that in quotes now because I'm understanding that I'm not mature, you're not mature, we are maturing, but an older, mature saint in God who came to me and said, why does so-and-so never talk to me? Well, number one, I don't know. Number two, they said, they never talk to me and they never smile. And from that point on, this saint just wouldn't talk to that person. That is repaying your saint maker. You know, they, they were positive, by the way, that this person was intentionally avoiding them in public situations. Those of you that are taking emotionally healthy relationships course, if that's you, if you have somebody who is ignoring you, or at least you think they're ignoring you, what would be the appropriate and healthy and emotionally mature thing to do? Oh, my goodness. What? Go to them and what? Just ask them what? Now, now, come on, think about your tools. What are you going to do first? You're going to say, I notice that when we are in a public gathering, you're not paying attention to me. What next? I wonder if there is something I have done. I notice, I wonder, I would rather 
This is what's emotionally healthy. Instead of just saying, well, you're going to avoid me, guess what I'm going to do? We'll repay our sin. That's, our, that's repaying evil for evil. Actually, in that case, probably it's not even evil for evil. It's evil for perceived evil, which is worse than evil for evil. Huh? All right. Number two, we avoid them. What's that? Pettiness for perceived pettiness. We avoid them. Uh, we just avoid uh, it's it's similar, but we're just we're just not going to look. We just you know, I, I, and this is something. This is a little bit different. This is something when somebody has specifically done something that has obviously been spoken about you, but but it, you know it's happened. See, the first case is like you're not sure, but you're just assuming. The second case, you know something has happened. You just avoid them. Why? Because you don't want to have to deal with the hard situation. We're going to look at what it means to, to bring good. Number three, we talk about them. We talk bad about them. We tell other people. This is a way of injuring them. We say, you know, uh, and by the way, I have to do a, a repentance right now. I just remembered this. When we were doing our, our book on Wednesday night, there's a prayer at the end of the devotional, and the prayer said, and, I, and we read the prayer. The prayer said, Lord, fill me with your love today for my saint maker, and we were supposed to fill in the name. And it was a, it was a spur of the moment thing, and the only person who I could see was Norm. And I said, my saint na- maker, Norm, and I, I want you all to know, I absolutely did not intend at all that Norm is an enemy of mine. So I apologize, Norm, for saying that, in case you were wondering. You could have come and asked me. I didn't perceive any problem. You didn't perceive a problem. Good. Number four, we make a list and we save it for later. How many of you know that Santa is making a list you're not supposed to? You ever make a list on somebody? And you go, well, you, you've done this and, oh, you did that. And, and so you start, you're remembering. It's a, even if you don't write it down, you're remembering it. You're remembering a list of things that have been an offense to you. This is a way to repay your saint maker. Because I, how many of you know, two things, two things are going to happen. Either one, you're going to continue to build up a haughty mind toward them because you know how awful they are. Or two, what's the second thing that's going to happen? Oh, at some point, you're going to go to them with your list. You ever been approached by somebody who has held something against you for years and years and years? It's just like, what? I mean, years ago, I, I was a pastor, and, and on staff, there were these other pastors. And one day, a guy called me, one of the pastors called me into his office, and he said, I know that we've had this competition going on for years. And I, I was dumbfounded, literally dumbfounded. I had no idea we were in competition. But in his mind, in his, in his a picture of what was happening, he was holding this thing for years, literally. He went back to an event that had happened three, four, five years ago and said, you know, you remember when that happened? I'm like, yeah, I remember when it happened. And it was something that had been done before the whole church. And he said, from that point on, I've just felt the competition between us. And I went, I, had, I have no idea what you're talking about. But he had held that against me for all of those years. A list. We keep a list of our saint makers. We keep a list of what they've done. And if, we're, if we keep that list and we don't deal with the list, at some point we'll take a whole list to the people. And how many of you know it's a lot harder to overcome a list of offenses than it is, you know, last week? <laughs> right. Last week, I just want you to know. We were, I, I need to check this out. Are you following me? So, uh, one of the reasons that we, we do, are not able to live in the Jesus family is because we're, we're actually good at repaying our saint maker. So, again, our verse today, 1 Thessalonians 5.15. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Would you read that last two lines with me? This is what we're supposed to seek after. Read that together. That which is good for one another and for all people. So this is a key in 1 Thessalonians 5.15, talking about the Jesus family, talking about a, a transformed family. The question is to define what is good right. for one another right. and for all people. That's what I want to look, t- look, look at today. Because if we're not careful, we take this principle of don't repay evil for evil. We say, you know, pray for your enemies and those who persecute you. And we become people, if we're not careful, we become people who become quiet about things that have been done against us. And we think that the good thing to do is just not say anything about it and just forgive and just move on. I want to tell you today that sometimes you may have to do that, but in more opportunities than 
than not, you need to go to the person and deal with the issue because that is what good for the other person, uh, what's good for the other person and for you. And it's good for all people. Here's what I have found about dealing with people over all these years. And here's what I find about myself. If I am habitually offending you, if I am habitually causing problems in your life, how many of you know that I'm probably doing it to other people as well? Is that, does that make sense? How many of you know a person who in their interactions with other people is a hurtful person? Raise your hand if you know somebody like that. If you know somebody like that, are they hurtful to one person or to many? Many. What is good for all people? That somebody sit down with a hurtful person and have an honest conversation with them and say, this is what I've noticed in my life. And if you're able to say, this is what I've noticed in other people's life. And I am concerned about how you're relating to other people. And I believe God has a better plan for you. You see, that's different than just avoiding and being quiet and being loving people who just pray for other people. That's not what God calls us to do in the family of Jesus. God calls us in the family of Jesus to confront. And when I say confront, I'm going to put some context to it. To confront and to go to the people that are, that are having the issue and to help for their sake, for my sake, and for all people. This is what I'm looking at. The church is meant to be brotherly, and there is an active seeking of good for all people when we are brotherly. So more than likely, again, if you've experienced it, other people have experienced So as an example, I want to look at Jesus. So Jesus, how many of you agree? Jesus is the most loving person that ever walked the face of the earth. He's the most loving person ever. And how many of you know that there were times in Jesus' life that he was, that in some people's estimation, he didn't look very loving? Right? So when Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, all you are is empty tombs with rotting flesh and bones inside. Does that feel loving? (laughs) What a loving thing to say. Why in the world would Jesus say something like that? He's the most loving person on earth. He must have made a mistake. No, that can't be it. What don't we understand about love and about honesty and about truth? Jesus confronted the Pharisees with the flaws that were, he knew what were in their life. Not only that, here's just an, an aside. He did it publicly. Ouch. Number two, money changers. This is the one that most people always point to. Jesus comes into the setting and these men are selling and buying and 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 they're controlling the whole process and they're making money in the process in the in the place of worship and Jesus in his most loving way right takes out a whip begins to whip over soon snap snap i mean come on it's a it's a very active and violent scene he's throwing the tables over You say, man, Jesus lost it. He must have made a mistake. No, he never made any mistakes. How many of you know that Jesus is the most loving person that ever walked the face of the earth? Sometimes it displayed what looked like and was anger. Okay? This was good for all people. How many of you agree that getting rid of that uh, that false front to worship was good for all people? And so Jesus is not just being nice and saying, you know, I would appreciate if you all would move from this place, although that voice is kind of how we view, you know, we tend to view Jesus. He's so quiet and loving. We don't know if Jesus was quiet. We don't, he may have, how many of you have ever thought, I've never thought of this. What if he had a big booming voice? Anybody ever imagine Jesus with a big booming voice? Of course not, because he's so nice. (laughs) Right? And so we imagine his voice so nice. Number three, disciples. Did you know that uh, when Jesus came down from his time of prayer with, uh, I guess who, Peter, Peter, James, and John? No, they were in the sailboat. Anyhow, um, 
Peter was there at least because uh, he wanted to build a tabernacle. And he comes down. And what, what had been happening? When he comes down, his disciples had been trying to cast out a demon. Do you remember that? And they, they did everything. And they, they could not cast this demon out. And Jesus comes down. He casts out the demon. You know what he says next? He says, how long am I going to have to deal with you and your faithless generation? Can you imagine? He just... How many of you understand that Jesus is looking at his disciples and he's like, what is wrong with you? Amen. Amen? Like, when are you going to get this? I feel that. <laughs> but it wasn't real. You know, he wasn't like, OK, guys, let's get together and and let's talk. With his big booming voice, he said, I don't have a big booming voice, so I can't do it. How long? There, I, just, I can just amplify it. And his family. Here's Jesus being loving to his family. His mother and his brothers come to see him, and they're outside waiting for him. And they're like, you know, we, we just came to see Jesus. And Jesus is like, I ain't going out there to talk to them. They're not my family. What? What? You're going to call up your family today. Now, your family, most of you, your family are believers, so you can't do this. But if your family are unbelievers, this was Jesus. His, his mother and his, his uh, brothers hadn't put faith in him. Well, we don't know about his mother. That's a, anyhow. But his point is, here's my, here are my mother and my brothers. Would you agree that that, is, that doesn't feel loving to mom and my brothers? Anybody? And then to Peter, probably my favorite. Hey, Jim, would you, are you able to stand and come here? Yeah. Right. I, I'd appreciate if you would be Peter for this morning. With your big booming voice. Yeah, with his big booming with, with voice? Peter's big I'm not a fisherman, but I'm a farmer. A farmer, it'll work. It'll work. They're the same, basically. Yeah. Um, so here's Peter. Here's Peter. And Jesus just says, they're going to kill me. And Peter says, no, they're not. <laughs> no, that, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. That's pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, and I want you to know, it's not like it was some theoretical thing. He's looking at Peter, one of the main friends of his, and he says, Satan, get behind me. That doesn't feel loving. I mean, you can imagine Peter, he's like, what? <laughs> Did you just call me the devil? This is Jesus' example for us to follow of doing good for what is good for everybody, for one another and for all people. And that's what I want to end with this morning. How are we going to live out this passage as Jesus' family members? And what I thought was really cool is this week in our Emotionally Healthy Relationships, we learned how to fight cleanly. Fight the clean fight. That, you know, we, we, uh, Paul said we're supposed to fight the good fight. So today I want to I wanna talk about fighting the clean fight. And it's important, this is the terminology being used by Pete and Jerry Scazzaro, and that, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not trying to make this into a fight per se, and they're not either. They're really, they're really talking about confront the issue in a clean way. Can I just say it that way? We need to become strong enough in our faith to be able and willing to confront the issue, but there's a way to do it. And this is what we need to learn. I am probably... Well, definitely more than other preachers and pastors. I am very much into how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? You know, we, we can live up here and say the Bible says and Bible says, but how are we going to do this, Johnny? You know, t- this week when we're supposed to not repay evil for evil, when we're supposed to do good for that, what's good for every one another and for all people, how are we going to do this? This is the how. So, so I want to just go through this list with you. So you can, you can write this down if you have a, note, a, a notepad or whatever. Uh, but number one, the first thing that we must do. So um, I need another example person. Um, everybody. Oh, that is amazing. Everybody immediately looked away. <laughs> Except for Marilyn. You looked right at me. Come on up, Marilyn. Would you be my example person? 
Marilyn has been habitually late for church. And I am getting very frustrated with it. But I don't tell Marilyn. I just am thinking about it. And so the first thing that I do is I step back. I, never, I don't go to Marilyn first thing. She comes in late for the fifth time in a row. Marilyn's never late for church, by the way. She comes in late for the fifth time. Once. One time. <laughs> once is enough. <laughs> she comes in late for the fifth time in a row. We're in the middle of the third song. I see her coming in. She doesn't even seem to care about the worship. She comes in. I don't immediately after church go to her and say, Marilyn, why in the name of... Zeus, I don't know. Uh, No, not. Why? Uh, Why? You know, and I just go, that is not the way to do a clean confrontation, right? What is the first thing that I need to do if I am irritated about her coming in late every week? What's the first thing I need to do? Somebody help me out. Do what? Think about the emotion. For me, before I even go to her, I go, you know what? I am... I'm irritated. I'm angry. Why? Why does that make me angry? Well, I could go through a, a list of things. Um, I feel, I feel she doesn't care. I feel. I mean, you, but but I have to. I have to evaluate myself, and I have to look at me before I before I continue to look at her, because most of us have not learned to do that, and so we go into the confrontation, the fight, with the assumption. That she is just an idiot. Yep, I've been called that before. She's been called that before, so I'm not out of line. No, are you? Fo- we may. Okay, okay. We don't. We don't say it out loud, and we don't even know we're thinking it. But if we don't stop and, and evaluate my part in this, we go into it thinking she is the problem, right? She owes, she owes me. She's the problem. She's gonna get it. She's a bad example for the rest of I mean, you can even make it sound like you're, you really have the high road here, right? But why am I feeling what I'm feeling? And there may be some valid reasons for that. Like, I think you shouldn't show up late for church every Sunday. I think it's dishonoring. I really think it's dishonoring to God. It's the one place that you feel like, eh. Anyhow, don't show up late for church, Marilyn. So... Secondly, when I start to realize the second thing I need to do, are you, anybody in emotionally healthy, are you recognizing some part of the ladder of integrity? Please. I, I need to think about why, again, why am I angry? Then why does this matter to me that I, uh, it matters enough that I need to go talk to her? There may be something that I go, you know what, it's okay. It's not really causing a problem. You know, sometimes you get angry about something and after you think about it, if you evaluate yourself, you go, Ew, that was really all me. You don't have to go to the person. But you say, this is really valuable to me because it matters to me that people come and honor God and honor the church and honor the body of Christ, right? So I'm, I'm, why does it matter? So I'm thinking through all of that. So then I decide, okay, I need to talk to Marilyn. I pick a good time. Let me just put this out there. If all of you are making a list of things you need to talk to me about, don't pick before church. You can pick other times. There are lots of other times in the week you need to come to me. So, Marilyn, come, come, on, come on over here because, you know, we got the video going and we need to be right oh. next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wave to all the people out there, all the seven who are going to watch this video. <laughs> so I go to Marilyn and, and I say to her, Marilyn, could I have permission to have a, what, if Marilyn has been through emotionally healthy or she's, uh, can, I, can I have a clean fight with you? Yes, I'd love it. <laughs> I like clean fighting. She's, uh, yeah, clean fighting. She doesn't want, like, dirty fighting, Norm. <laughs> she likes clean fighting. So, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a couple things in a clean fight. Number one, I'm going to state the problem. I said, Marilyn, I notice that almost always, at least the last five weeks, I'm sorry I've been counting, but at least the last several weeks you have come to church late. And if Marilyn is versed in this, at some point she's going to make sure she heard what I'm saying. Uh, we're not going to do all that right now. 
because it gets monotonous. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to secondly, I'm going to state the problem, then I'm going to state why it's important to me. Okay? So I've done, you can't do this if you haven't self-reflected. But if you've prepared, you say, this really matters to me, and, and here's why. And then I go through, you know, reasons why I think it's, I think it's important. I'm not saying this is why God thinks it's important. I'm saying in this case, it's an opinion. This is why I value this. I talk about this is why it's important to me. And then I fill in the following sentence. When you show up late, I feel angry that you would do that to the church. This is, this is every course you've ever learned on confrontation. You don't say, you make me angry when you show up because she didn't make me angry. I felt it for some reason within my own self. And then I state my request clearly, respectfully, and specifically. I'm asking you today if you would consider changing your Sunday morning routine so that you can arrive at church, not just at 1030 even, but 1015, be a part of greeting the people. And then I state that, and then I say, you know, give her an opportunity to repeat back what she's heard. What have you heard? So um, you're bothered by the fact, or angry, the fact that I keep coming late, and um, you feel that, you feel that that uh, doesn't support the value of having people come on time so they can be supportive of the other, of the people in the congregation, um, be there to greet people, be uh, um, respectful of the fact that we're all coming here to honor God together mm -hmm. as a group, and that makes uh, you feel that I'm not honoring that. Yeah. So that's upsetting to you. Yes. So would you be willing to consider changing your pattern? Is that something you can do, and would you be willing to... Make an effort to change that. Yes, I would be willing to make make a bigger effort to get here on time and greet people. And because, well, the main reason is because everybody else thinks that the rest of the church is the church and not them. Mm. But we all need to be the church to everybody else too because they're looking for that in each of us. Yes. So you can really see the value yeah. in me correcting you. I'm just I do. <laughs> I do. I see it. You see it. Now, if you're doing this, listen, how many of you, oh, this is a, thank you, Marilyn. Would you, she did excellently. You're good at this. Thank you, Marilyn. I like clean fights. She likes clean fights. Uh, sometimes, this is really dangerous, but sometimes, many times, too often times, your spouse is your saint maker. Huh? That's a good opportunity to say amen. Everybody that, you know, all together. Amen. Okay, we don't know who said it. We just, we just understand. Sometimes, you know, and as you're working, especially in closer relationships, as you're working through this, so we're doing something. If you are able to get clarity with a person and if you are able to help transform, be a part of Jesus' transformation process in somebody's life so that they are living out Jesus' values, you have helped not just yourself. See, this isn't about me. It's about me. It's about the other person. Because if I'm confronting because I believe something needs to change. Now, sometimes in that conflict, sometimes in that clean fight, Marilyn may say, you know what? I have to stop in and see my mother every Sunday morning. Right. And, and I have to take care of her. And it's just, I, I try and I try and I try to get here on time. Well, now I have a whole different perspective. It wasn't her that needed the change. I needed to understand. But now when I see her walk in, I know that she's been with her mother and I'm blessed that she's taking, you understand? So this is why this is so important. It, we cannot just avoid, we cannot just sh uh, cold shoulder. We have to be willing. Now, here's what's important about this. The first step, I don't know if we followed all this. Yeah. Yeah, okay, we, we followed all the steps there, and Robert was following along. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a fight, a clean fight with somebody who you're closer with, it is actually appropriate to write an agreement. 
Here's what's going to happen. Now, now I think the example that we had in our class was a daughter, an adult daughter, an adult daughter talking to her mother about how she was being treated. And so they wrote an agreement, said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to come back in four weeks. We're going to see how we're doing. It's really building relationship that is open and honest and honoring. And, and this, is, this is what I believe we're talking about uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So again... Here's our verse for today. See to it that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always, somebody say always. Always Always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Can I just finish with this? Seeking, always seeking after that which is good for one another. It starts with me. It starts with me. I have to seek after what's good for me. And this is where the self-evaluation, the willingness to say, I'm kind of petty. Actually, it's kind of not a big deal. What does that mean? I don't have to go to the person. We don't always have to run to everybody who does a little offense every time of every moment, or we will not have time for anything else, right? So, so it's not like we have to always confront another person. First, there's, there's a season of self-reflection. Secondly, good for one another. I'm not approaching them so I can get this off my chest. I believe that if I am going to my daughter to talk about a situation, I'm going with the hope that this is going to be better for both of us. And then the third part is for all people. When we know of somebody, um, and and I have had opportunities, um, I, I have okay. I, going back to the ways we treat that, oh, we treat this. If you're like me, and many people are, and you like to be liked. You will tend not to go and confront people about things in their life because you tend to know (laughs) there's a very real possibility they won't like you after that, right? And and so so Jim and I had this, you know, in our years of pastoring and eldering here, and there 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 have been people who have wounded others habitually, and we have avoided. We've talked about, you know, what should we do, and and after years we have. There's one in particular that we sat with, and, we, and we, we, we didn't have our clean fighting thing. But we did sit down, and we prayed over it, and we, we said, how can we share this in a loving way? And we shared it in a loving way, and the person essentially said, I'm out of here. You see, not everybody you go talk to is, uh, the point of that is not everybody you go talk to is going to receive it and be changed. <coughs> but if they will, everybody experiences the blessing of it. Now, here's the final thing. Only in Jesus can you do this. You're not going to walk out of here with your little tool. (laughs) And you're going to be like, okay. Now, it'll make a difference. I believe that if people would implement something like fighting cleanly and iceberg and all of that stuff, those things in and of themselves can make a difference, but none of it will make an eternal difference unless it comes from the full love of Jesus that we have within us. So you can't do this without Jesus. It starts with Jesus. It, 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 it goes through with Jesus. It ends with Jesus. So only when we have grown emotionally are we able to approach this in a confident way. So take this home in this way, if you don't mind. I'd appreciate it if you'd take it home. In the area of living fully in Jesus, we need to become a people who in the fullness of the love of Jesus are able to face our fear. And that is facing the fear that they'll reject me, facing the fear that I'll do this wrong. You have to, be, you have to take some steps. So living abundantly in Jesus means we're able to look at another person and say, you know what, God has called me in brotherly love to be someone who is is able to connect, or, or able to have this confrontation kind of a style. Some, uh, secondly, connecting authentically is very simple. <laughs> We're going to be people who become those who approach the issue rather than avoid it. Again, that takes prayer. That takes time. You, you step back. You, you process the thing. You, you're aware of your own self before you approach. And thirdly, to engage. Here's what I believe. If we were to become a body of believers, small as we are, if we were to become a body of believers who began to live authentically in this way with one another, starting at home with our spouse, with our children, in our workplace, 
if we were to become that kind of people, they, the people out there that we meet with, would begin to hear the stories, we would begin to see the fruit, and it is, it is of itself a drawing factor to Jesus. The Bible says, Jesus said, or First John tells us that it is how we love one another. That's what people will see. And so engaging the community happens when we begin to live out the, the, this hard thing right here. Before you go out and start going to, you know, the most hostile place in the world, to the enemies that are out there and start trying to do this there, this week, try it with your spouse. Try it with your kids. Try it with your brother, your sister. Try it with the people who are closest to you. And begin to live out a pattern of healthy relationship. That makes us a welcoming place. We become a safe place. We become a place of truth. We become a place of authenticity. And Jesus becomes higher and higher. And people begin to know this is a different group of people. Amen? Would you stand for a moment? I want us to pray together. Just take the hand of the person next to you. And just by way of of dedication and commitment, I want to um, ask God to anoint us. Even as we took hands today, we're, we're holding hands with the people next to us. We're connected. God, this is the body. This is the family you've given us to and you've given to us. We are here to be life givers. And we are here to receive life from the people next to us in Jesus. And so, Jesus, I'm asking you to anoint us, that there would be a flow of your anointing that would take us to a new level of relationship that allows us to do what is good for one another and for all people. And Lord, whatever that means, Lord, this week, some of us might need to say, you know what, I really need to address this issue. You might need to call somebody and say, would you pray? I'm getting ready to do a a clean fight. Help it to be, pray that it would stay clean. Pray that I'd I'd do it in in a way that is honoring to the other person and to Jesus. But this connecting us together today, Lord, is a symbol of how you want to do in the real life relationships. Lord, maybe it's somebody else. Maybe it's somebody not here today. Maybe it's somebody who used to be here. Maybe it's somebody who, uh, who is in my workplace. Maybe whatever. Help us to become authentic in the way we confront evil or bad or wrong or something that is harmful to us. In Jesus' name, your anointing be upon us. Change us and transform us for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. Jesus, we want you to be seen. Jesus, be seen in our families. Jesus, be seen in our marriages. Jesus, be seen in our sibling relationships. Jesus, be seen in our in our church relationships so that you're glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.